the prayer for elimination this morning. Would you pray that prayer with me this morning? Oh God, the Holy Spirit comes to us and among us. Come. Pentecost is the birthday of the church. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn to that particular passage in Acts, the second chapter? We'll be reading through that first part of that chapter, beginning with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that seemed to separate it and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. And then skipping on into that passage to verse 13. Some, however, made fun of them. As they said, they have, they've had too much wine. And then Peter stood up and with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not as you suppose, it is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Hear these words. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servant, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and billows of smoke the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the lord and this is i think one of the most important verses in that passage and everyone who calls on the name of the lord will be saved brothers and sisters this is the reading of the word of god My mom always said that when you have a dry mouth, it's because you're telling a lie. She said that before she knew I was going to be a preacher, so. You ever hear the, the, the expression, you know, it seemed like the, the stars and all the planets came into conjunction, and it was a special event? Well, today is kind of that way. Today is Pentecost Sunday, as you've already heard, but you also know because you can see on the communion table, we celebrate communion the first Sunday of the month. So sort of everything in the church that is special and significant and symbolic of who we are as disciples comes together this Sunday. The power of the Holy Spirit, the communion of the sacraments, which is a representation of the presence and body of Christ in our church and in our lives. So everything's sort of coming together today in a very special way, to celebrate the power of the Holy Spirit and the purpose that you and I have for being disciples in Jesus Christ. I like to think about the fact that, yes, we celebrate Pentecost as being the birth of the church, but if you've studied anything in church history, or maybe just history at all, but if you especially have focused on church history, you know that there has been occasions over and over again where there's sort of been a birthday 
Well, recently I came across a, a situation. One of our Methodist churches out in the Midwest had decided that it had come to a time to make a very difficult and special decision. They had decided to close the church. That's difficult. Can you imagine if we were to make that vote here? Some of you may have remembered what happened with Webb's Chapel. That was before my time. I can say something there. That was before my time when Webb's Chapel was closed. That feels good now. I feel better. All right? But if we make that, to make that kind of decision, well, they made that decision for a purpose. They had come to the point that they had seen the way the condition of the church was going and felt that it was time to go into a new direction. And so their way of approaching that, with the bishop's blessing, obviously, was to close the church, to spend a period of time assembling a team to relaunch the church at a future date. So I've been running into situations now when I hear of events being scheduled in the church and now the church where they're calling a launch date, not a birth date, but a launch date, so that in a sense that we're going to start in a new direction. One of the things that I have appreciated in Denny's preaching was the last Sunday's sermon and understand out of the circumstances that it was rooted in that it was time to do something different. I think it's time to relaunch in the life and ministry of the church. Things are changing. Uh, we were having that discussion back in the choir about how some of us view the church and that's not the way the church really is now. Things are different and have changed. I'd like to, for you to take a hold of that bulletin that you have. Now that's something that you've probably been holding on to every Sunday that you've been in church. Some of you, I'm not going to name any names, I know made paper airplanes out of these things and launched them. Because I picked them up after church on Sunday, so I know that. But you know, in my course of ministry, and that goes back to 1972 when I came here. Well, it goes earlier, but I'm going to go just back to 1972. I'm not going to do prehistory. But 1972 when I came here, you know how we did these things? You know how we got this thing? And it hasn't really changed much. Do you, you probably haven't noticed, oh, we may have changed what's, in, what's over here and what the cover looks like and what the contents are. Yeah, those things have changed, but for basically... It's been an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with some kind of cover of the church or when we subscribe to the Bolton service, a different one Sunday. But it's been basically the same paper. But things have changed. When I came here, we did these things on a mimeograph machine. How many of you know A.B. Dick? Uh, right? Uh, teachers particularly. I don't think A.B. Dick's in existence anymore. You know how this thing came to be? Ah, ha, 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 ha. you must have run Boltons for one of the pastors. <laughs> okay. It was done on a mimeograph machine. And in order to get this onto this piece of paper, you took a stencil, which was some kind of membrane. <laughs> I don't know what else to describe it. And you put it in a typewriter and you typed it and it cut a stencil. That ain't all to it, folks. You had to cut that stencil in half, or just about in half, or a third and two-thirds. So you did this side on one piece, you did this side on the other piece, and most of us didn't have a wide carriage. We had the typical typewriter. And poor soul that only had a manual typewriter. Because a manual typewriter, as you know, doesn't type the same kind of pressure with each particular printhead. And can you imagine trying to cut a stencil? I mean, just putting on a, going through an ink cart, ink, ink thing, and you still had to go through that sometimes, but you had to cut that stencil. So not every letter was hit with the same power to cut that stencil exactly right. So some words, letters came out perfect, some came out fuzzy, some came out as a blob that way. And then, lo and behold, if you were not a good typer, typewriter person like I was, you had to correct that. You had a special correction fluid that you had to take and cover that, that mistake. 
and then type it again. Hopefully, it would cut through the stencil and the correction fluid, and you wouldn't have an ink blob on the thing. Then you put, took that stencil. Now, remember what I said about the size of the carriage? You could get this side in the carriage fine, but this side was longer than the carriage with the stencil. So you had to fold that back and then cut it. So then you took and you glued the stencil together. And then you went to your faithful A.B. Dick co copying machine. I could never get around one without getting ink on me. I don't know, even if I walked by, it, ink jumped out on me. But you would put it on. And you, those of you who aren't familiar with a mimeograph machine, Essentially what it is is a machine with a drum that has ink in it that turns. It has a fabric pad that goes over that drum that has perforation. Looks like a very, looks like a colander. Tiny holes. So the ink passes through the drum as it's being spun and it goes, soaks the, the pad uh, that's over the drum and then you hook the stencil on and you pull it over and then you clamp it back down. Hopefully, you didn't get a crease in it, because then you'd had not a blob, but a streak in your, in your bulletin. And then you ran the bulletin. Well, and you basically did black and white. Now, I had a clergy friend. Earl was into media, <laughs> I guess is what you would call it. He'd like to use red ink and green ink and so forth like that. If you wanted to use another color, you had to get another drum that had that color ink in it. You had to do the stencil so that it didn't print everything in a multicolored thing. It only printed in each specific color. So you had more than one stencil to do this bulletin if you wanted to do different colors. And then, of course, you folded them. And most of us never had a folding machine. So basically, that's the same way it's probably was done, it's done today is you fold them. Well, that's the way it started out in 72. Then came along copying machines. Now with electric typewriter, and hopefully if you had an IBM Selectric, you had a correction side of the, of the tape that went across there, so all you had to do was back up, hit it, and that correction thing would come in and take that ink off or blot it out, and you could retype. And you type the bulletin, as a ma made a master, and then you went to your copying machine or a secretarial office and had the copies done and could be done in, uh, could be done that way. Then copying machines could be done in color. Well, if you're still doing black and white, that doesn't make much difference. But then comes the era of word processing. And now you can sit down to your computer and do your master to do this bulletin in any color that you want to be done because the copier now can do multiple colors that way. And you typed your master and you went, it, went had it printed out and you had your bulletin. Now what can happen, and I'm sure this, has, this happened with this particular bulletin today, is that I text Denny, email Denny, information to go in this bulletin, like the prayer, and he then copied and pasted into his master, and lo and behold, I, I don't know for sure what facility is here, but you, you have the possibility of sending that from your computer to the copying machine so it prints it. This looks like it has always looked since 72, but believe me, it is a whole lot easier now than it was back in 72. Things have changed. You and I have seen changes that have taken place since 2020 because of the pandemic. Thanks to Denny's technical experiences and the cooperation of others in this church to help him in the process, we're able to take this service and send it out to people who are not just at home nearby, but people who are home farther away or people who may want to see it later on when it's a little bit more convenient to them in time of being able to watch. Obviously, things are changing so much in the life and ministry of the church. I've seen it. 
If we had some of our children here, I'm trying to look around, and I don't want to call names, who's the youngest one in here, but can you imagine, I just can't believe the changes that some of our children are going to see in the way we do church in the next 20 years. Even maybe the next 10 years, because it has changed so much in my 50 years of being in ministry. As remember, Denny said it's time to do things differently. It's, I really think it's time for new beginnings. Because things have altered so much and changed so much in our life and in our church that it's a time for us to rethink how we're doing things and what's go, what is the kind of ministry that we want to perform. Pentecost was a launch experience. And if you study church history, that has happened over and over again. We have relaunched the church because of issues that were taking place in life and church, because of things that have gone on, because things have just drastically changed. We no longer have circuit riders. No place for me to tie up my horse. Did you see the thing in the Montana school where the kids' senior class got aware of the fact that there was a law that if you rode a horse to school, how many of you rode a horse to school? Okay. You rode a horse to school, the principal was responsible for feeding and caring for that horse at school. So 12 of them rode horses to school, and I think the principal must have been in on it. He was pictured feeding them and caring for them and taking care of them. Circuit riders is the way we used to get around. At Leesburg, Lees Chapel, United Methodist Church, was a circuit rider church. It's believed, they tell the story, and I'm not going, wasn't around to say yay or nay, but they say Francis Asbury preached there in his circuit riding days. Methodist ministers were known to fall off horses because they were working on sermons and stuff while they were riding and fell asleep. <laughs> That's pretty bad when you're working on your sermon and fall asleep, isn't it? Methodist ministers didn't live much beyond 30. Of course, maybe many other people didn't either, but the life of a Methodist minister or circuit rider back in those days was so rough on them that basically there were people in communities and the churches that would say, open their homes to care for a worn out circuit rider. If anybody wants to take me, I'll be glad to, you know, especially if Bobby kicks me out. <laughs> Things have changed, and they're going to change more. So I'm not saying that whatever we do to relaunch the Methodist Church, and we're coming to a point where we're going to have to relaunch, whatever we do to relaunch the Methodist Church won't be the final one. But I do know and I do believe that there has to be somewhere that what's going on in our world and what's taking place in, with not only the technology but just what's happening in our world, that somehow rethinking what we do and how we do it is important. This morning, the, sermon, the, ti the title of the sermon is Win Wine and Bread for the Journey. Basically, I guess I should have said, win wine and bread for the relaunch of ministry. You see, I think whenever we leave here, we should be looking forward to new opportunities for ministry and service. We should be seeking ways that we can serve Christ. We have today the celebration of the Holy Spirit. The symbols of the Holy Spirit of what? What did they see when, at that Pentecost experience? Fire, wind, yeah, fire and wind. In a sense, that's part of our Methodist symbology. You look at the cross and flame, it sort of implies the Pentecost experience. And sign language, which is basically a lot of mime, Methodist sign for, the sign for Methodist is, what happens when you do that? You get heat. Sign for Baptist is, now you got to make sure you don't just leave it there because otherwise you just left them under the water, you know. <laughs> you bring them back up. But the, the Methodist sign was heat, fire. The power of the wind, you know what it's like. In 1997, 
Fran came through here. That was an unbelievable night for us. Woke up in the morning and as we looked out and the dawn was breaking and you could somewhat see outside because we were wondering what outside looked like. Nothing had happened inside, but outside we didn't know what was going on. There were these dark shadows all around our cabin. Bobby said, what's, what's that? What's that dark shadow? It was a root ball of a tree that was going the other way. I counted that day, after Fran had gone through, 50 oak trees that had been blown over. My pines were fine, and I realized what had happened was the leaves, since Fran came through in the summertime, that the leaves had matted together because of the rain, and they acted like a sail. So when the wind pushed against them, it was like pushing against a sail. And it blew them over. The pines, the needles, they just went right through them that way. Maybe you read with me, as I did, the account on the internet of the family that was parasailing down in Florida along the Keys. And a wind came up and caught the, par the sail that they were parasailing. That's being a, like a parachute being pulled by a boat. And the boat captain decided to cut the cable to the people that were in, on the sail. And the wind took them two miles across the water, dragging them. Ultimately, the mother died. The child was seriously injured that was with her. But he cut the cable because he was concerned that the power of the wind filling that sail was starting to drag his boat. And he had no control. So he cut the cable causing the, the loss of the mother that way. But that's the power of the wind. When it pushes and it fills our sails, when it pushes against our body, it can move us into other places. It can give us... I like to, I like to walk on the track when the wind's behind me because it's easier walking. Because of this wide body, it helps move me along that way. But the power of the wind fills us fills the sails, it blows against things, and it moves things. You and I need to feel the power of the Holy Spirit moving us. You and I need to feel the power of the Holy Spirit putting us on fire, making us warm. There's a picture, I guess the guy stopped taking pictures of the church. I don't know how many more angles he could get pictures of of Allensville Church, but he pictured the church in the morning from that side of the church with the sun coming through windows. And one of these back windows, the sun was shining through that window and that window, and it looked like the church was on fire. The interesting thing, I, when I saw that, I thought, well, the pot fire was in the congregation. The fire was where you're sitting. Now, the fire should also be where whoever it is that's pastor standing up here, but the fire of the Holy Spirit should be upon us. Whether we see tongues or we just are energized by the fire and the wind of the Holy Spirit. If I said this is a combination of two things. You received this morning, you will receive this morning, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. It's a sacrament that reminds us that God, Christ is present in us and in our worship. But it's also, too, an opportunity for us to make repentance and to do things new. The old ritual for communion used to start out that with the invitation. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are intent on leading a new life, draw with faith and take this sacrament to your holy comfort. In other words, this is a time to say, I've messed it up as being a disciple. I have fallen short of what it is to be a disciple. But I don't want to be that way anymore. I want to change. Take this sacrament to your comfort and lead the life Christ calls you to. Why? When? and wine and bread for the journey. Because you and I are on a journey. For whatever time you and I have left, 
on this world, we have a journey to make. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. You know that song. You've heard children sing it. You may have sang it in vacation Bible school. But you and I are on a journey of life of discipleship. And today is an opportunity to remember not only who we are, but whose we are. No turning back. There's an old joke about a Methodist church that was on fire. Excuse me. Shouldn't have started that. It's just water in there, folks. There's an old joke about the Methodist church being on fire. The pastor obviously was there, probably lived close to <laughs> next door. <laughs> but anyway, he was walking around trying to comfort and console members of the congregation. And he looked and he saw, he saw Sam. Sam hadn't been in church in a long time. And he was kind of mystified. So he went over to Sam. He said, Sam, he said, are you okay? He says, yeah, I'm fine. He said, Sam, you've not been in church in a long time. I haven't seen you much of you. And he said, well, pastor, the church hadn't been on fire before. <laughs> are we on fire? Are we Methodists? Are we in a journey of the life of discipleship? Because I think it's a time to relaunch for your life and mine to be disciples. So ye that do truly do, ye who do intend to repent and need a new life, take this sacrament to your holy comfort and live the life of faith. Walk the life, the journey of discipleship. Let us serve the Lord. Let us be on fire for God in this community. One of the other things that I thought was interesting, and I'm sure we'll hear more from Denny as he goes through Acts, is the fact that he talked about how the disciples were told after Pentecost, shh, hush, hush, quit talking. But they proudly, boldly proclaimed. Is the church today, are we today, are you today proudly and boldly proclaiming the love of God in Christ Jesus? Are you fulfilling the scripture that says there, as Peter addressed everybody, he said, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you have that fire for the Lord, for others? It's time for us to think and to start anew with our lives. Amen. Let us stand for the glory.